Welcome again. For those of you who don't know, my name is Colleen. I lead the programming for the battery. I'm really excited to welcome everyone to another State of the State with Cal Matters. Um, these are a deep dive into the issues that we are all facing as uh, in California. And tonight's topic is about reopening our economy and the vaccine rollout. Obviously something that's on all of our minds and very important um, in the coming days. So we're joined tonight by three journalists from CalMatters. CalMatters is a battery powered grantee and a nonpartisan nonprofit news organization that covers the state government and its policies. Tonight, they're gonna to help us navigate the politics in California, the high stakes and the state's emergency response to the pandemic. So before we get started, I'm gonna pass it over to the CEO of CalMatters, Neil Chase. Colleen, thank you. And thanks everybody for being here tonight. Um, hard to believe, but it's been about a year, right? Since we started realizing a little bit what was coming. And then uh, over the first two weeks of March last year, we were in Sacramento scrambling to put our new office together, which was supposed to open on March 15th. So that didn't happen, but uh, a lot has happened. And I can't tell you how proud I am of our team and the way they stepped up. Uh, our team worked hard anyway, right? But when this came, really came in, into, into full focus for us around this time last year, uh, everybody needed answers. And we stepped up in a way that uh, was a little bit different from what we had done in the past. We had always done a, a great job of covering state politics and policy issues, but the focus became much more on individual people and what they needed, um, where, how to take care of your senior parents, how to take care of your kids, what's happening with education, your own health care, other kinds of issues, unemployment, evictions. And our team has been working really hard over the past year to get as much of this information as we can and get it out to people. Um, it's been tough. It's been a little uh, you know, up and down emotionally to do these kinds of stories, but it really is uh, gratifying to be able to help at a time like this when so many people need information and, and need the help. Uh, and it's wonderful to see a lot of you here tonight, a lot of uh, good friends of ours uh, and some new friends. Appreciate everybody coming. Um, we're going to uh, hear from three people on our team who've been immersed in this coverage uh, all year and then um, uh, have some plenty of time toward the end for questions and answers from you. If you have questions as we go, feel free to throw them into the chat. You can message them just to me or put them in the chat to everyone, uh, and we will get as many of the questions in as we can um, and uh, uh, hope we can answer a lot of your, your questions this evening. Uh, we can't tell you where the vaccine is available, unfortunately. So if that's why you're here, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, but other than that, I think we've got a lot of good stuff to share. So let me turn it over to our legislative and politics correspondent, Laurel Rosenhall. Laurel. Thanks, Neil. And thank you to the Battery for having us. Um, it's great to be here. So yeah, I'm going to just um, give a kind of an overview of what's going on in the Capitol right now in this year. Then I will turn it over to my colleagues, Ana Ibarra and Lauren Hepler to go into more depth about the pandemic response and the state's economic recovery plans. And um, then we'll get to your questions. So thank you so much. So, you know, big picture action at the state capitol really largely follows the calendar with politicians setting their agendas in January, passing a state budget in June, and then sending all their bills to the governor at the end of the summer. Um, so we're still early in the cycle at this point, but because of the pandemic, there has been a lot of added urgency on issues like assistance for small businesses and school reopenings. And so we're seeing the governor and the legislature take action on those kinds of budget items earlier than usual. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we go here. Um, the number one issue in the Capitol this year for the governor is really the vaccine distribution. He, he's got to nail this. Everything flows from that, both in terms of reaching lofty policy goals, um, getting life back to normal, and that's linked with his own political vulnerability, obviously, with the recall hanging out there as a possibility. So um, initial rollout of vaccines was a mess. It seems to be getting better. There's still a ways to go. And, um, and that bleeds right into the school reopening issue, um, which is the other huge thing that's going on in the Capitol. And another thing where he is facing um, a political challenge. Um, you know, Newsom and lawmakers have been negotiating for months. They've on, on a plan to reopen schools. You wouldn't think that that's as complicated as it is, <laughs> but they finally reached a deal that should 
probably get signed into law this week. Um, it, we need to be clear, it does not require schools to reopen. It still leaves that decision up to the local school districts of which there are more than a thousand in California. Um, but it does dangle a financial incentive to try to get them to reopen. So $2 billion, um, if they, you know, they'll share of that, obviously. So they would, um, in order to get that money, they would have to bring back students in grades, uh, kindergarten to grade two by April 1st. And then by the time their county um, exits the purple tier and gets into the red tier, they would have to offer, um, you know, in-person instruction to all students in all elementary grades and at least one grade in middle or high school. That's a weird requirement that I've been asking around a little bit. We could talk about that more later if you're curious. Um, and then it has another $4.6 billion that would be to allow schools to address learning loss, things like maybe summer school or a longer school year, or other kind of supports, because obviously being out of school for a year has really impacted learning. Um, the, the school's reopening deal strikes this important compromise on the issue of teacher vaccine. And you know the teacher unions, they wanted assurance that they would not have to go back to the classroom until they were vaccinated. Newsom did not want to make vac vaccines a requirement because there are a lot of districts that have reopened or have made agreements to reopen and he didn't want to mess things up by adding new requirements in those places that have made agreements locally. So under this plan, Newsom is setting aside 10% of the state's vaccines for teachers, creating some new opportunities for them to get vaccinated at the mass vac sites that, that, that um, the state has opened up with FEMA. And so he's effectively making it more likely for teachers to get vaccinated before schools reopen, but not requiring it as a condition of reopening. Um, this is, you know, like I said, one of these like early budget action items that they're doing now, which is a lot earlier than usual, getting trying to get this money out to the to the school districts to to um, incentivize them to reopen. Um, and then the other big early budget item that they did <clears throat> just a couple weeks ago is the $7.6 billion stimulus package. Lauren will go into more details, but that basically includes grants um, for small businesses and a, um, a California stimulus of $600 cash payments for low income workers, including undocumented workers who were left out of the federal stimulus program. Um, how is California doing this? There is more money than expected in the state budget. The um, economic impact of the pandemic has turned out to be very different than the state's bean counters projected a year ago um, when the pandemic began. And you know, as it turns out, the, uh, the segment of our society that has been hardest hit are also the people who pay the least taxes. So the uneven nature of the pandemic, the fact that um, people who make a lot of money have um, enjoyed um, increases in the stock market, been able to transition to working from home without losing their jobs. Um, and while you know, service workers have either lost jobs or, or income, um, it means that the state tax revenue has remained really robust, much more so than they initially figured when they made a lot of budget cuts last year. So there's more money than expected and Newsom has made clear that he does not, is not gonna support any new taxes this year. Um, as far as the agenda for the rest of the year, I'm gonna tick through a few um, big issues that I see on the horizon for the legislature and the governor this year. Um, you know, housing is one of them. That's been something that they've really um, failed to make much progress on, in including a bill that last year seemed like on the cusp of passing until literally the final minutes of session when it, when it failed um, or it, it, it didn't move fast enough basically and the clock struck midnight and they couldn't um, do anything further with it. But um, that it's a bill that would basically make single family neighborhoods have to allow duplexes and in some cases fourplexes. 
Um, there's also discussion of another bond to build affordable housing and um, another bill to streamline building of denser, denser housing for up to 10 units. Um, there's issues related to policing, to civil rights and, and Black Lives Matters, one that um, we're likely to see come back that failed last year has to do with um, decertifying police officers for misconduct. Right now, California is one of very few states that does not have a law that de that requires decertifying police for certain kinds of misconduct. And so that's one thing they're going to be looking at. Um, there's probably going to be a very intense debate about fracking. Um, the Democrats in the legislature are really divided on that. And um, Newsom asked for the legislature to send him a bill banning fracking. That was before everything heated up with the with the recall. So, um, you know, this is an issue that's hard for Democrats because labor unions don't want to ban fracking. They're on the side of the oil companies and environmentalists, of course, do want to. And so that will be a big political fight. Um, broadband is another one where um, I'm expecting something, but it's unclear what. The pandemic has highlighted how uneven internet access is around California, not only in um, rural areas that don't have good service, but there's a lot of inner city areas where the internet companies don't provide um, don't provide good service and that um, has made it hard for kids to do distance learning who 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 live in these um, poor poor inner city in your inner city areas so they may be discussing you know a bond or a fee or something like that to um, to, to increase internet broadband service um, Lauren will get into this more, but there, there has been an enormous mess at the unemployment um, with the unemployment system and a ton of fraud. So there will be legislation and discussion around how to improve that. And the political backdrop of all of this, of course, is the recall. And it has not qualified for the ballot, so it's not a certainty, but it is looking more likely. We probably won't know for sure until sometime in April. Um, and the key question that I'm watching is, you know, whether any credible Democrats jump in as um, as potential contenders. The the structure of the recall um, election is not like a normal election. There are different rules of the game, so there is no runoff, and that's really important to keep in mind. The question is: there's two questions on a recall. One, do you want to recall? in this case, the governor, that's a yes or no question. If more than 50% of people say yes, then whoever, the next question is who should replace the governor? And Newsom cannot appear on that ballot. So there will be many, many, many names to choose from. Um, right now, there's only you know a couple of Republicans that have announced formally. Once the thing qualifies for the ballot, many more people will jump in. And whoever gets the most votes wins, even if they don't get a majority. So this is, though we think of California as a very blue state, um, because of the rules of the game, someone can win with hypothetically 20 or 30% of the vote. And, um, and so the recall is um, a very serious thing you know, to keep an eye on. And like I said, whether a credible Democrat jumps in could, could be a real game changer. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anna to, to talk in more detail about, about how California is handling the pandemic response and specifically the um, vaccine rollout. Thanks, Laurel. So um, I thought I'd start uh, a bit with uh, where we are in terms of infections and then move on to vaccination. So, I'll start with um, two of the key things the state uses to decide uh, when counties can reopen further. So the first is what percentage of tests are coming back positive, right? So today the Department of Public Health uh, reported a 2.6 positivity rate, and that's a huge drop compared from the peak in early Janu January when about 14% of tests were coming back positive. And the other metric is case rate, and California is currently reporting about 10.2 new cases per 100,000 people. And so those are important numbers because 
that determines where counties fall in these colored tiers. I'm sure we've all, you've all heard about the purple and red and, and yellow. And so purple means higher case rates, higher positivity rates, and counties are supposed to work toward yellow, which represents um, minimum virus spread. And as you come down this colored ladder, a county is allowed to resume more business and social activity. And actually today, seven counties uh, move from purple to red, so moving in the right direction. Um, several smaller counties, but also Napa, San Francisco, San Luis Obispo, and Santa Clara counties. Uh, so now we have 40 counties in purple, 16 in red, and two in orange. Again, just a few months ago, you know, or a few weeks ago, we we're all in purple. And as cases go down, so do hospital admissions. Um, as of yesterday, there were 5,300 people in the hospital with COVID. Uh, just to compare to earlier this year, mid-January, there were 22,000 people hospitalized with COVID. That was the peak, at the peak of the winter surge. So a big difference and of course, less stress on hospitals. Um, as I'm sure everyone remembers in early December, California issued a stay at home order because it was running low on ICU beds. Um, on January 25th, the state lifted that order because according to its projections, ICU capacity would grow and all regions would have enough capacity for um, expected admissions. So the good news is that um, that has held true. And according to the state's new projections for March 1st in four, uh, four weeks from now, all regions will see more increased capacity and the Bay Area and Southern California will have close to 40% of their ICU beds available, which is actually starting to get us closer to, to normal numbers. Uh, that said, uh, we are also starting to see more spread of new versions of the virus. Um, in California, we have two variants of concern that are showing up increasingly. One is this UK or B117 variant, uh, which has been mostly found in Southern California, particularly San Diego County. Um, we also have a California, AKA the West Coast uh, variant, uh, and that has been mostly detected in Northern California, specifically the Bay Area. Uh, researchers are still learning a lot about these new strains, uh, but what we do know is at least for the UK variant, we know it's about 50% more infectious. Um, so the UK variant has been around a little longer. Um, it's been studied the most. It was first detected back in September in London, um, but the California variant we know less about, uh, but some data suggests that it is also spreading um, very fast. And just as an anecdote I, that I'd share, you know, last month I spoke with uh, the medical director at Stanford's, uh, Stanford's virolo virology lab, uh, which does uh, this genomic testing to identify mutations and new variants that could be of concern. Um, he told me that in early January, uh, finding the West Coast variant in samples was rare, rare but by uh, mid-February, they were finding this variant in about a third of the samples um, screened in his lab. So um, spreading and replicating fast. Um, some epidemiologists I've talked to say there is a good chance, however, that the winter surge we experienced was in part because of the contagious variants. So there's, um, you know, this idea that we have seen uh, some of may maybe the worst of it, uh, of these new variants. Um, and of course, concerns uh, are whether people can become reinfected with a different uh, version of the virus and whether new variants can be more deadly. So the good news is that we now have vaccines and the vaccines that we do have so far seem to be effective uh, against the COVID variants found in the state. Uh, the challenge now is um, getting as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible to gain this widespread, widespread protection that we need. So uh, vaccines, um, California has administered 9.4 million doses and um, it's really picked up the pace these last few weeks. Uh, when the vaccines first rolled out, as we all know, California and the governor got a lot of heat because out of all 50 states, California ranked near the bottom of doses administered uh, per capita. Uh, California is now right in the middle. So these past few weeks, the governor has been visiting vaccination sites across the state. Um, the state and counties have opened up these large uh, vaccination centers like at fairgrounds and stadiums. Um, you also have uh, two large FEMA sites, one down in LA and the other at the Oakland Coliseum. Um, there's supposed to be a third FEMA site for Fresno, um, but there has that hasn't happened yet. Um, and then of course you have health systems and, and pharmacies uh, as providers. 
So uh, California is in the middle of reworking its vaccine distribution uh, with Blue Shield taking over. Uh, this means that Blue Shield will make recommendations to the state on how many doses should go to counties um, and which providers in those counties should get those doses. Um, now, this transition is supposed to help speed things up, but also simplify this patchwork of vaccine eligibility rules that we've seen um, and that have really varied by county. Uh, there has you know, been a lot of confusion and frustration over who's eligible where. Um, I think the most clear example was when the state opened up vaccines to seniors. You know, state officials said anyone 65 and over can get a shot, but people then you know, heard otherwise from their county officials. Um, you know, some counties were doing people uh, only 75 and over. Um, and then sometimes it also varied by provider. You know, Sutter had some rules, Kaiser had other rules. Um, so it was very confusing, very frustrating. Um, similar uh, with opening up vaccination to essential workers and teachers. Um, you know, counties are doing things at different uh, pace. So this, this with Blue Shield taking over, it's supposed to sort of um, help create some uniformity. Uh, of course, this change doesn't come without concerns. I think the big one I've heard from county officials um, who worry about losing control over the infrastructure they built. Um, you know, some counties have complained about not really getting clear answers from Blue Shield, but of course, this is all, all just started this week. So, you know, it's, it's uh, supposed to be, you know, it's a work in progress. Um, I think the number one issue, um, you know, continues to be supply. Um, I think the state has set up, um, state and counties have set up, uh, have built this network of providers that can, that can offer the vaccine, but at the end of the day, you need the actual doses. Um, so far, California is reporting getting about 1.5 million doses a week from the federal government. Um, that is supposed to ramp up with, with the approval of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And again, that's the, the single dose vaccine um, that can be stored in more, I guess, normal refrigeration. You don't need that ultra cold refrigeration, which is good news. Um, California has set a goal of administering um, 3 million vaccines a week. So we'll see if that works out. Um, and this is also um, with Blue Shield taking over and counties being on the same page, um, you know, also means that there will be this one stop for vaccination signups. And that is the My Turn website, which I'm sure everyone has checked out by now. I guess the trick is just finding the appointments, right? So um, I think I'll leave it at there and then I can, you know, um, happy to answer any questions on vaccines um, during the Q&A. And I'll uh, hand it over to Lauren, who will talk about uh, the economy. Hey there, thanks, Anna. Appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to cover a couple of topics before we jump into Q and A. I wanted to go through what this new phase of reopening the economy means, what's happening with small business aid, since there's billions of dollars flowing through that now. Um, also, the mess in unemployment, like Laurel alluded to, and this big issue of the California exodus. Obviously, being in San Francisco, I'm sure this is something that you've all heard about ad nauseum. Um, so I want to get into what's myth and what's reality there. Um, in terms of reopenings, Anna mentioned that we did see more counties, including San Francisco, Napa, Santa Clara, move back into that red tier today. So expect to see gyms, movie theaters, indoor dining, reopening. Um, and when I talk to the owners of these businesses, the thing that keeps coming up is just how hard it's been to adapt on the fly. And obviously, like a lot of them say, clearly we've all been adapting our lives on the fly to all of this. But for them, the question is really like how much debt they're taking on when they don't know how long people are gonna be furloughed, how long their spaces are gonna be essentially vacant. Um, so the big questions are, whether we still will see things like commercial evictions, bankruptcies tick up down the road. Um, and I also have heard a lot of frustration from business owners like uh, hair and nail salon uh, owners to talk about um, frustration with enforcement. Like they'll say, I know plenty of people who are operating out of garages or they're operating in their own salon sometimes against regulations. And in their opinion, the state isn't doing enough to sort of crack down on that and level the playing field. So these are all conversations that are probably gonna continue in the weeks and months to come. Um, 
there is this uh, big thing to watch with the state's approach to economic stimulus. So just last week, the governor signed off on a $7.6 billion package. One of the main priorities there was $2 billion for small business grants, and that builds on an existing $500 million um, that was yeah, so sorry, up to 2 billion now, 500 million has already been rolled out, but the problem has just been scale. Um, so more than 330,000 businesses applied in the first round and only a couple thousand got the grants, which can max out at $25,000. So you've got a lot of people who are saying, yeah, this is great. Like, obviously it's money we don't have to repay, super valuable, but um, some of the sectors that have raised concerns about it not sort of reaching them or uh, being as effective for their models are nonprofits um, and then also cultural institutions like museums or independent music venues that say this just doesn't track with like the amount of revenue we have or how expensive our rents are if you're in a big city. Um, so there's going to continue to be jockeying kind of a push and pull there. Um, but the bigger sort of challenge here is sort of reaching businesses that are traditionally cut off from private loans. So the state is doing a couple things there. There's this um, rebuilding fund that is relatively small now. It started out with about $100 million, but it's a public-private model where they're trying to get capital, low-interest loans out to uh, groups that have historically been underrepresented. So women, uh, minority-owned businesses, and businesses in rural parts of the state. Um, and the big question is going to be whether they're successful in doing that. They're trying to tap into um, some of the small business infrastructure that's there. These groups that honestly, even though I've been an economy reporter for 10 years, I hadn't even heard of like community development, financial institutions, other types of small business centers um, that a lot of times kind of operate in their own little world. And now they're going to be front and center in this effort to rebuild the economy. Um, and that's going to be crucial for businesses that are really sort of struggling to, to get those bills paid right now. Um, with unemployment, man, where to begin with this one? So the scale here is also overwhelming. Uh, last spring, unemployment spiked to a record 16%, and recent audits have really showed how unprepared the state was. The technology was antiquated. The call centers were not organized. We were kind of primed for something to go really wrong if there was another recession. And obviously, the scale of the pandemic and how swiftly it shut down the economy really caught the state flat-footed. Um, so in terms of what that's meant to real people, um, by last summer, we were at a backlog of 1.6 million people who were still waiting for claims to even be processed. Um, issues with days long waits on hold trying to get through to the state, uh, but then it really shifted in the fall and we started to hear these very specific concerns from people saying, I can't even access my money. The state pays out unemployment through prepaid debit cards through Bank of America. Um, and they were saying all of a sudden the card is getting declined, which is obviously embarrassing if you're out with like your kid and that happens or something like that. Um, and in some cases, people had filed uh, fraudulent charges um, when they had seen like, oh, my card was used in Nigeria or it was used in Texas and I've obviously been sheltering at home. Um, and in a lot of cases at first they got that money refunded and then it was reversed without warning by the bank. Um, so there's a lot going on right now with how to unravel all of that. There are proposals at the Capitol to add a direct deposit option to so send money straight to people's bank accounts if they do have a bank account. Uh, there's two class action lawsuits pending against Bank of America. So um, we're going to see how that evolves. Um, but just in terms of I wanted to kind of break down because I think we all know at a high level, okay, this is kind of a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, but there's one San Francisco example that's really stuck with me. I talked to a gentleman named Delario Woods. He actually moved out to the Bay Area after Hurricane Katrina and resettled in Oakland. And it, things were going great before the pandemic. He was uh, working in the kitchen at one of the big tech offices in San Francisco. And so of course he got furloughed when the office shut down. Uh, but things seemed to be okay. He was getting unemployment. And then last fall in October, suddenly he was out buying a burger for his daughter and his unemployment debit card got declined. And it just started this spiral where at first it was like a couple weeks of, oh man, money's getting tight. And then it became, I can no longer afford my apartment in downtown Oakland. So by the time we caught up with him, he was living in a friend's car in West Oakland. Um, his 
phone had uh, been shut off, like all these things have cascaded in so many ways for people that were barely hanging on. So we can talk about small business grants and all these things the state is structurally doing, but that sort of personal toll is going to be the much bigger challenge to, to try to fix after all of this. Um, and to that point, I mean, another thing that has kind of been lingering under the surface for a long time is this whole talk of people moving out of California. So I first moved out here and started covering the economy in 2012 when uh, obviously the recovery from the Great Recession was happening. And I remember at that time, all the business executives from Phoenix or Austin coming in and doing these road shows, trying to get the tech companies to like move their employees out to, to their cities and it'll be cheaper. Everyone can have a big house. It'll be great. But as we know, um, the Bay Area then enjoyed a massive tech boom for the, the intervening years. Um, so there's some of that happening this time around, and you have seen obviously the Teslas, the HPs uh, moving people to Texas, and that's certainly consequential. Uh, but when it comes to how many people are moving at an individual level or even sort of small and mid-sized businesses, that's much less clear. So we have been bad at counting historically sort of this migration, and it's really kind of coming back to bite us in a moment like this when we really want to know what's happening. So we're still waiting on the most detailed numbers, which come from the census and the IRS, but we're getting some sort of early peaks that sort of show maybe things are not as bad as feared. Um, you've got postal service data out there that says most people who are leaving San Francisco are staying in the Bay Area, like East Bay, South Bay. I'm sure we all have anecdotes of people who are off in Tahoe or other places right now. Um, but the majority are not going out of state. But I do have to say it's a little hard for me to reconcile because I've talked to a dozen people now who have moved out of state entirely and they range from like a family where they just were sick of renting and it was the, the parents in Modesto were sharing a bedroom with the baby while the two sons were sleeping in the living room and they just said, forget this, this is completely unsustainable. Why are we doing this? And they moved to Salt Lake City. And then I've talked to folks who uh, are kind of at retirement age in uh, like Southern California is one of the big areas, but also the Bay Area. Um, and they say, you know, like we're going to cash out, sell our house that's appreciated a lot and then be able to move out of state and have a really high quality of life. So all of these threads are real, but the question is kind of um, how much staying power they have, whether there's a boomerang and people start to come back now that there's this carrot of much lower rents in San Francisco than we've seen in a really long time. Um, so there's, there's lots of things to talk about. And I think um, we can probably go ahead and open it up for questions if that works. There is no shortage of stuff to talk about, um, and I'm sure no shortage of questions. Um, one question, Lauren, in the chat that, that uh, I have no expectation that you've been following closely, but in case you have, uh, how the state is handling uh, the PPP loans as far as tax returns go, do we know? Yeah, this is a huge question. And that's one of the things that I was alluding to that businesses in different sectors, like this person says it would affect the R&D credit as well. Um, so I've heard that uh, we need to watch the language carefully on the next stimulus bill that's coming out of DC that could change that. Uh, but it's as far as I know, it's still being interpreted sort of between the state and federal levels. Sorry, I don't have a super concrete answer to that. I can add a little bit more. I, that there, there is a bill in Sacramento um, that deals with this issue and they were hoping to pass it when they passed the, the California stimulus package a couple weeks ago. Um, there's still some negotiations ongoing about the details. And so that one was not passed. I know the bill is carried by a, a assembly member named Autumn Burke. Um, she's a Democrat from Los Angeles. Um, anyway, so she has a bill that would conform it. I don't, I don't have the details. The details were sort of still being negotiated over, but they do in, they did say when they passed the, it's the stimulus package a couple weeks ago, that they intend to get to that very quickly. So I wouldn't be surprised if that one um, is taken up in the next, you know, like within this month of March. Neil, you're muted. I sure am. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the, the idea that the, the, the state has uh, so much more money than we expected 
right? Is that, um, do we have any idea how, how accurate that is? Are, are the current projections, do we have any idea how much money the state really has and how bad or, or good the, the, the revenues are gonna be for this year? Or are we still just guessing? I mean, they are projections because um, they, you know, they don't know for sure until the tax money, till people pay their taxes by April 15th. So there always is a big revision of the budget in May after, um, after they collect all the taxes that people pay and then they can go from projections to reality. Um, but um, the budgeting at the beginning of the pandemic turned out to be really off because they assumed that the financial impacts of the pandemic would be much more widespread throughout the economy and not so much hard hitting at the um, low income end of things and um, seeing you know continued wealth creation at the high end of things. So basically in a because California has this super progressive tax structure where high income earners pay a lot higher taxes. Um, that sort of saved the state budget in this um, very uneven pandemic economy that we're having. Thanks. There, there's a, a question here about small businesses getting help. I know we have a number of small business owners and operators here on the call tonight. Um, the programs from, from cities, counties, the state and federal programs, um, are there answers that, that are, are there answers that are more clear than what's out there about how to find these programs and how to navigate them? Is, is anybody working on simplifying or streamlining the process or trying to help people who are trying to get help with this navigating these things? Yeah, so there's a couple good starting points for that. Um, if you're interested in the grants now that there's, you know, this total pot of $2 billion out there for small businesses, that website is careliefgrant.com and that has all of the eligibility requirement and everything but the thing I've found that's also useful is that a lot of small business groups like small business majority pick your local chamber of commerce or small business development center are running really frequent webinars that go through exactly this um, if you click around the state's website there's a couple other resource uh resource guides, but sometimes they're a bit out of date. So I've found that going to sort of the small business advocacy groups, they're the most tapped into what's actively approved now that people can get access to. Well, thanks. Um, question here that is not about any of the topics we just talked about, but I think a lot of us have had the same impression, right? That crime is up in California. Um, is there any discussion of this at, at the legislative level at all or at the, the regulatory level? Um, property crimes, things that seem to be happening during the, during the pandemic that were kind of off for a while and are now back, is that being discussed at all? You know, um, I, I can't say that I have heard much about it, to be honest. Um, there is, every year there does seem to be a bill introduced related to um, packages getting stolen off of porches, because obviously that is something that um, really bothers people. And so, um, but so there's been various proposals to like increase penalties or things like that. But the general, the general trend of policymaking in the criminal justice area in California is much more toward um, um, more forgiveness, more second chances, and trying to not pass policies that will increase the prison population. Um, you know, California is under a federal court order to reduce the prison population. And under former Governor Jerry Brown, a bunch of new laws were put in place that um, were meant to do that through, through various things. And um, giving people a chance at parole, earlier parole, depending on their crime and moving some certain kinds of offenders into county supervision, either county jails or county probation type programs. And so in general, in the legislature, um, any kind of policies that would result in the creation of a new crime, which would then result in more people going to prison is generally not gonna get passed into law. That's the general trend that we're seeing in recent years. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
question about rent forbearance and, and building up debt. And I think this applies to a lot of categories, right? People who uh, have been able to defer their payroll taxes, been able to defer their student loans, been able to defer their rent, um, uh, been able to defer other payments that, that, they, that they need to make during the, the, the pandemic. Um, people who are under eviction moratoriums right now, but are still gonna owe that rent at the end. Uh, how much conversation is there about ways to help people not just for uh, put those debts off or delay the payment of those debts, but actually you know be able to survive the uh, uh, when 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 the when the limits on those payments are lifted? I, I think this is um, kind of a wait and see how how it develops issue. Um, there was a lot of urgency in January on. Um, on the evictions issue because California had passed a, a, a relief plan that was going to expire at the end of January. So they basically bought themselves some more time, but it does, um, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, there, there's a real tension between sort of wanting to help the tenants who can't afford their rent and not wanting to um, cost the landlords too much money who, you know, have then can't pay their mortgage. So um, they they struck a deal that sort of only gave people the relief if they continued to pay a quarter of their rent. Um, but people are still accumulating a lot of debt. Nonetheless, um, I did provide a link to the state's information on that. Um, I hope it will be helpful. It's probably not going to answer all the questions, but I hope it answers some of them. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, speaking of ongoing questions, Anna, you probably got whiplash from trying to follow the vaccine rules and the, the phases and the rollouts and, and things like that. Um, where, can you, Colleen's question here is, is there an outline of the current rollout, right? What's next? What's the timeline for these phases? And I guess how much, how much faith can we put in that now, right? Are they, are they, are they holding to the schedules or is, is what they're saying about the, the, the rollout and the schedule actually happening? Yeah, so at the very beginning of this, um, California did try to, not so much a schedule, but it did try to, uh, you know, very specific tiers and faces. Um, it didn't really pan out that way or it hasn't panned out the way. Um, things keep changing um, depending on supply mostly, but, um, you know, the, their, the state have these advisory um, wards that sort of recommend the state um, how to move and who to vaccinate next. There isn't really a schedule for who um, goes next, but they are expanding um, kind of uh, by phase. So what we do know is that, for example, um, starting March 15th, uh, the state will open up vaccination to uh, people with pre-existing or certain medical conditions that uh, make them high risk for uh, falling severely ill. Um, and then after that, the state is supposed to move um, based on age. Um, however, like I said, this is, it keeps changing. Um, you know, there is uh, this idea that as more vaccine becomes available, um, you know, more groups will become eligible more quickly. Um, I can put a link here um, with more, a little bit more detail. Um, as Colleen mentioned in her um, comment, um, the state right now just has a, a schedule of, you know, who's who, who, this is who we're vaccinating now, and this is who goes next, but not really anything beyond that. Um, again, the idea, like I said, after people with certain medical conditions, the idea is to move um, by age. So we'll see if that, if they actually stick to that, you know, again, this is all changing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, uh, it keeps you working hard. Um... And I, with, with the White House announcing that there may be enough vaccines for everybody by May, I guess it takes a little bit off of schedule, <coughs> excuse me, a little pressure off the schedule, right? Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Here's a great question for a lot of us who are in San Francisco. When are, con when are the live concerts coming back to San Francisco? When, when are we going to see a live show at the Chase Center? That's more yeah. of a, a, a pool, I guess, or a betting pool than, a, than an actual question anybody can answer, right? Right, right. Probably not anytime soon. Although I did interview this epidemiologist from UCSF recently, and he said that he's hoping that, you know, or that he said he's almost willing to make a bet that by Thanksgiving, we all are going to be celebrating with our families and celebrating big time because we skipped last Thanksgiving. <laughs> that sounds relatively safe. Um, mm -hmm. We have a little more time if people have other questions. Um, there's a, uh, the, the, the comment here is noting that, that some, some events are being announced and uh, 
I don't think anybody in San Francisco is surprised that Las Vegas will probably have a live event before we do, right? Um, the the over, you know, before this pandemic hit, we were immersed in very aggressive coverage, uh, and now with the help of battery powered, thank you very much, coverage of the big divide in California, uh, the economic inequity divide uh, between the, the, the wealthy and the, and the less fortunate, uh, the economic divide between the Central Valley and the coasts. And this pandemic has obviously made things a lot worse. Do we have any sense yet of how much worse things are? Uh, if, you know, let's say we are back to normal by Thanksgiving or whatever the new normal is, how many more people will be out of work? Um, how much, how much slower some parts of the economy will be? How much we're even thinking yet about um, uh, how to go back and, and um, you know, how, how to fill in some of the, the training that we need for new jobs and things like that, how to, how to build the economy back once this is all over, or is the focus really just all, all short term right now? No, there's a, a lot of emphasis in some of the conversations in Sacramento right now on job retraining, but that's another one where it's tricky because for a long time, the state has been trying to do um, like more vocational school investment, uh, try to get folks trained for jobs in like clean energy fields, these types of things. But um, it's tricky to adapt that infrastructure, obviously, to, to jobs that are changing quickly and what the employers need. Um, and it's interesting, too, just to see kind of how, like, uh, how this is actually playing out on the ground. I was talking with the woman who runs the Workforce Development Agency up in the Reading area, and she said they've been really perplexed up there because while well, everyone's talking about how bad the unemployment situation is, they've had jobs they can't fill since like last fall. Um, so in a lot of the logging industry jobs, uh, more heavy industry type stuff. And she said, there's a lot of things that seem to be going on at once. One, with the schools still being closed, it's been really hard for people to get back to work, um, especially if you don't have daycare, those types of things. Um, but then there's also just like this understandable reluctance to go back um, while the health picture is uncertain. Um, so I talked a couple of weeks ago to Dee Dee Myers, who's Gavin Newsom's top business advisor. She was also Bill Clinton's press secretary back in the day, fun fact. Um, but she said um, they're also thinking about interesting ways they can use employers to speed up vaccinations. So like whether they start doing on-site vaccinations. I know some of my friends that work at tech companies in the Bay Area have been getting information from their employers about sort of how they can do that. So whether that can be rolled out to other industries will be interesting to watch. Um, and then of course, there are other things that um, employers are gonna need to do to enable that, like give people time off to go get vaccinated. Um, but I mean, I have to say, it's definitely exciting that we're getting to this point where we're thinking about things reopening other than just like continuing to be in kind of the, the stagnant moment that it seemed like we were in with the winter shutdowns in particular. Yeah, I don't know how everybody else feels, but everybody I talk to and everybody I, I encounter seems to really be having that feeling of I'm just done with this, right? It is, it has been way too long. Um, I want to thank everybody for being with us this evening and for the good questions. Um, we are, as I said, working hard to cover this and will be, you know, for, for a long time to come. We are, just as the legislature is, we're starting to think about our coverage and how we cover the changing California over the next five years, the, uh, the recovery, the rebuilding, the, the, different organ the different state that we will be uh, once we come out of this, as we come out of it. Um, and so we're, uh, we're working hard on that and planning a lot of growth over the next few years to build out some of these beats where we have uh, one or two or three reporters working that could probably be used four or five or six or probably a hundred on some of these beats if we could, uh, as, as we try to fill in some of the gaps in journalism in California. We do it all with your support. We're very grateful for your help, for the Battery's help in general, and for the Battery community supporting us. Um, really want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, and I think uh, Colleen's going to wrap it up for us. Thanks, Neil. And thank you all very much for that. These states at the states are always the best way to spend an hour to learn and take a deep dive into these issues. So um, as Neil mentioned, uh, if you're interested in learning more or staying up to date, Cal Matters has an amazing newsletter. I strongly encourage everyone to sign up for it. I think Christy earlier um, echoed that sentiment as well. So you can uh, get all that information on their website. We'll also send a follow-up tomorrow with some more links to some of the resource 
sites that our reporters mentioned, as well as the recording from this, you can revisit it and share. Um, and if you're compelled, please donate to Cal Matters. Um, we supported them through Battery Powered recently, and they are a nonprofit organization. And so if you're passionate about this type of news and making this sustained, please uh, donate. And um, we'll look forward to partnering with you all again for another State of the State in the future. And one of these days, we're going to toast you all at the Battery in person when we're able to Can't meet wait. safely. Can't so wait for that. With that, thank you, everyone. Have a great evening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Good night.